and we really went down harder on R&D and deeper in the mobility and the broadband. At the same time, in the second phase, we started to get scale in that. We start to invest in what we call the target areas. Everything from OSS, BSS, TV media, uh, IP and cloud, and of course the industries. And now we are in the, in the third phase, the value phase, where we of course going to continue to prove our core areas, which is very much about mobile broadband and all the attached services. And then of course also seeing that the target areas that we're now investing in a couple of years, they have been growing very well, over 20% the last couple of years, now also being accretive to bottom line. That's what we're seeing in the last phase here. Uh, not going to spend too much time on the financials here, but I know that John Friedkamp, our CFO, will have an IR track for all the analysts here and talk more about the financials. That strategy and the disruption that we're seeing in front of us in our 10-year plan has led to the model that we call the strategic horizons of Ericsson, where we have the core areas, where we continue to, of course, invest, where it's very much a focus to continue to have our strategic leadership in these areas. And then we have the target areas, the white bubbles. That's the target areas where we're establishing the leadership right now. And clearly we have done a lot of uh, progress in these areas. And for all of you that's going to take demo two shares, you're going to see a lot of proof points of all that. The target areas were selected by Ericsson because they're adjacent to our core areas and it makes us relevant in our transformation with our customers that are going further into new areas to bring in new revenues from new different type of industries. So that's how it is. If you just look into 2016, the main focus for Ericsson 2016 is of course continue to capture business in the core areas and gradually improve our profitability. And in the target areas, very much continue the growth that we've had there at the same time as we now want to be creative on bottom line. And finally, we have a cost program of some 9 million Swedish kronas in order to be more efficient and more competitive in the market that we're doing right now and should be delivered 2017 that we feel very confident on. So that's a, a little bit where we're heading and the company are going. I will not go through all the press releases we have done the last couple of days, but they're all supporting where we're going with our strategy. And there are so many, both with partners and of course with customers and also new type of product and solutions that we're doing. And this is just a, a portion of them coming from uh, basically starting with the announcement from the Consumer Electronics Show in the beginning of January. Themes also when we speak here in Barcelona. So let's start with 5G and what is happening with 5G. The 5G is of course uh, something we started to talk to about two years ago and last year we had the demos here. The last 12 months, dramatic change in interest in 5G and what's happening. When we built 2G, 3G and 4G, all of them had some commonalities. They were built on standardization and they were built of course on interoperability in order to bring out new types of services and, and solutions globally very efficiently. And that's why it's so important to work together. The requirement we have on 5G are quite astonishing. 100 times more devices should be carried at minimum. 1,000 times more data, data volumes should be handled. We need to get down to five, below 5 milliseconds in latency on the products. And of course, we need battery lives for years, not days or uh, hours, we need to have years. Quite astonishing uh, requirements that is put on 5G. And I think that the main part of them we can do. Some of you remember, uh, for two years ago on our first test pad, it was this large. Now you can see the radio base station being at that, that size, like this right now. And to be honest, I have the latest chipset in here. If I can find it, it's so small. This is the smallest chipset uh, we have right now and the next generation 5G chipset. This is the base for building the radio base station in the future. It has uh, 64 radio elements and 64 antennas in it. And uh, over there, in the bigger version, we are now doing 25 gigabit per second in speed. And that's uh, already now in 2016. So we are very confident that we continue to lead this industry when it comes to 5G and what we're exploring and doing. But you cannot do it alone again. And that's why it has been so important for us to partner with our customers all around the world. 
And uh, we have more than 20 operators right now all around the world that we are working with uh, when it comes to the test bed. Because we need to learn from their customers and from our customer and operators what are the use cases that are going to be used in the future. How are we going to evolve it? And I said, the test bed has gone from 5 gigabits per second and now we're doing 25. I heard even that they made 26 gigabits uh, yesterday in a test bed that's over there. So clearly a very quick evolution on the technology. We're not only engaging with operators, we're also engaging with research, academia, in order to see that we continue to be the world leader on 5G. As we've been on 2G, 3G and 4G, we're confident that we're going to lead the 5G world as well. And that's very, very important for us. There are different use cases. And I think that some of the areas that we have selected uh, to work with, utilities, transport and public safety, or three industries that are very early, together with media, that are very early, see use cases for doing, doing 5G. Everything from short latency uh, that can do autonomous cars, to battery life for having uh, control over sensors that are outside the power grid, but of course data loads in smart grids that are controlling the, the electricity in the future. All this we're seeing coming from industries that are so interested in 5G right now. Think about the 2G, 3G and 4G was mainly done for consumers, how they use the technology. The 5G will also be for industries and the society, much broader. That's why the 5G is also designed from radio all the way up to the core with all the key elements of the core application, the IP, the OSS, PSS has to be part of it. And Ericsson going to have that full portfolio to make an end-to-end -end 5G, which is so important. If you then look into IoT, and IoT is of course one of the big use cases when it comes to 5G, especially when it comes to sensors uh, or devices that want to divide, uh, need uh, throughput, bandwidth, data loads, or latency. We are estimating some 28 billion connected devices by 2021, and we still have the vision of 50 billion connected devices, and that will happen, but it's going to be a couple of years later. Very important. In this whole value chain, we have changed. We have changed to work in networks, IT, media, and industry. And our customers are changing as well. The operators predominantly that I talk about right now. How they should address IoT and the possibilities in IoT is one area, but there are many others. We have talked about the operator model that I have had for the last couple of years where you see three different types of operators. You see the network developer, very much focus on the network. And of course, in an IoT context, that means that you build a very robust network that can handle sensors and can handle different types of use cases with devices. That's of course a smaller part of the revenue stream you can get from the whole IoT. Then you have the service enablers, the second part of uh, the carriers that we see in the world. They of course are enabling with IT service provisioning of the different devices and, and doing a lot of analysis on, on, on part of the network. That's another way of getting part of the IoT revenue a little bit more. And then lastly, you have of course the IoT service creator where you Basically, you're doing everything from the network, the service enablement, the provisioning, and also you do applications and even devices sometimes when you go into IoT. And then you have a much broader possibility of bringing in revenue. So this is three different ways you can do it. And you can say that the one hesitating to go in, they usually see a very big complexity in doing it. And uh, we have been working with many operators, both with services and with all our softwares in IoT. And I think that in our case, we are now launching the Airs on IoT transformation, which is a combination of assets in professional services, the 66,000 people in services, and the assets we have in software. That combination can support operators that want to climb higher in the value chain of IoT.